Hello to everyone and welcome to HIV and Faith in Resilience and Renewal, a conversation on the legacy and future of the U.S. faith response to HIV and AIDS. I thank each and every one of you for joining us for these very important conversations. The HIV and Faith in Resilience and Renewal is a webinar series developed by the United States HIV and AIDS Faith Coalition. And this series will explore the 40 year legacy of US faith communities toward ending the HIV and AIDS epidemic. It will feature conversations with a variety of leaders from faith-based organizations, houses of worship, community organizations, and government agencies who will address the intersections of race, class, gender, sex, sexuality, and religion in the history of the HIV response in the United States and identify lessons learned, offer insights, and share their vision for what will be needed to end the HIV epidemic. The event will center the commentary of faith actors from multiple faith traditions and practices, people living with HIV and HIV practitioners who have been involved in the HIV and AIDS advocacy since the beginning of the epidemic. Our first conversation today on the legacy and future of the U.S. faith response to HIV and AIDS features two people who need no introduction but deserve to be praised nonetheless. Carrie Goodman is a program and development consultant focusing on nonprofit organizations and faith institutions. For over 13 years, he has been dedicated to working with faith communities to establish and expand health programs across the United States by building their capacity to address health disparities that greatly impact their congregations and the communities they serve. He serves in many capacities on the national planning boards and coalitions where he operates as a faith partner, strategic developer, and faculty presenter. Carrie is the founder of the Black Men's Wholeness, an initiative designed to engage Black men in dialogue regarding topics that reassures wholeness, such as trauma, emotional, and mental health, including fatherlessness. Our other guest, Dr. Pernessa C. Seal, is the founder and CEO of the Balm and Gilead Incorporated, a not for profit organization celebrating the three decades of providing technical training and services that strengthen the capacity of faith institutions in the USA and Africa to promote health education, disease management, and services which contributes to the elimination of human suffering. She was named by Time Magazine as one of the most influential persons in the world. Essence Magazine in its 35th anniversary selected her one of 35 most beautiful and remarkable women in the world. Ebony Magazine named her one of its Power 150, and she was selected by Women's E! News as one of its 21 leaders for the 21st century. Over the next 20 to 25 minutes, they will discuss about the impact of the National Week of Prayer for the healing of HIV and their vision for the role of the Black church for ending the epidemic. Carrie and Dr. Seal will then be followed by responses from Minister or Elder Kamarion D. Anderson Harvey and Elder George Kerr. Elder Kamarion D. Anderson Harvey is a vibrant and visible trans woman of color with a passion for inclusion and equality for all. Kamarion is the Alabama State Director of the Human Rights Campaign under the Project One America Initiative. Kamarion becomes the first trans person of color to serve in a leadership role with the Human Rights Campaign in the organization's history. Before joining the Human Rights Campaign and relocating to Alabama, Kamarion worked in the field of public health and education, managing both local and national prevention initiatives focusing on HIV and AIDS and other health disparities that impact marginalized communities. Kamarion is the founder and the previous executive director for Black Trans Women, Inc., which is the first national nonprofit with a 501c3 with a programmatic focus to uplift the voices, hearts, souls of Black trans women and in alliance with the Black Trans Advocacy Coalition. Finally, Elder George Kerr III is a nationally renowned community activist and former grassroots nonprofit executive who continues to be a staple in the fight for social justice in the greater Washington, D.C. metropolitan area for more than 27 years. He is the co-founding and previous executive director for the nonprofit organization START, 
or syringe training advocacy resources and treatment at Westminster Presbyterian and currently serves as the executive director of G3 Associates, which focuses on social justice, faith and harm reduction, and LGBTQIA seniors. George is an elder and clerk of session at the Westminster Presbyterian Church. Our conversation will begin with Carrie and Dr. Seal, followed by our respondents. Uh, we encourage all of the participants to engage our guests with questions and answers in the question and answer box. Um, and then the last 15 minutes of this conversation, we will be sure to address as many of your questions as we can. Again, thank you for joining us. And we now turn it over to Carrie and Dr. Seal. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Carrie Goodman, and uh, I'm so excited to be here with you all today. And I am so excited about this opportunity to uh, share and dialogue uh, with one of my mentors, Dr. Pranessa C. Seal, and we we affectionately call her Dr. P. Uh, so if you if you hear me say Dr. P, that's that's who I'm talking about, uh, Dr. Seal. Dr. Seal, how are you doing today? Carrie, I'm yet holding on, and I am so excited and happy to be with you all today and uh, to have this conversation with you. I'm so proud of you and all of the great work that you are doing, and I definitely, I feel, I'm, I'm definitely a mentor, but some days I feel like a mama too, so I am so <laughs> proud of you. Thank you so much. Um, so we're just going to jump right on in because we have, uh, I feel we have a lot to unpack in a short amount of time. Um, so uh, before we get in, um, one thing that I always like to do is just to do a check to see how you're doing. Um, if you could give me one word uh, to describe um, how you feel in the midst of uh, the climate of our nation, what would that one word be? Fear. And can you expound on that just a little bit? Why? Why? <laughs> In one word. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, that's fear is not a word that I use often. Um, but um, I, I, I use that word because we are, we are experiencing so many different avalanches at the same time. You know, uh, certainly with the loss of uh, John Lewis, uh, it has brought up uh, a lot of um, history where we've been, you know, in my, in my tenure of living. Um, I've lived through Jim Crow. I've lived, I was born a little colored child down in, uh, in South Carolina. I've worked with um, many presidents, you know, I've worked with uh, Bill Clinton, um, uh, George Bush, uh, oh, I, I can't name them because I have too much going on in my head today. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think it's been four presidents, uh, and I've been in the HIV movement since Ronald Reagan, when Reagan refused to even mention the word uh, HIV. Um, so we've, we've been here long enough to see uh, times when we have disagreed, uh, but the, even the disagreement had a place of coming together. Uh, and now I just, I, my fear is that the, as, the, as we watch the guardrails coming off of so many uh, structural, institutional uh, uh, places in this country, including uh, health, including health access, including, you know, uh, uh, the, the non apparently non-compassionate just to make sure that people are, are safe and being able to to stay in their homes or to feed their children or uh, to deal with this uh, complete, completely out of control pandemic. Uh, it's like every day there's just a new level of fear and it just doesn't seem to be getting any better. So that's not a word I use often, but that's definitely the word I use today, fear. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so many people, um, when the conversation of HIV and faith is presented, many people um, immediately go to the bomb in Gilead. Uh, you can't, you almost cannot mention faith in HIV without mentioning the bomb in Gilead. And so um, for a moment, just take us back to, to 1989. Uh, what were your thoughts? Um, what pushed you uh, to even begin the work? Well, you know, uh, back to 80, 1989, I uh, was one of the first um, 
AIDS educators in uh, New York City. AIDS was uh, uh, new to the city. Uh, I was uh, coming out of an immunology career. I had done research for Rockefeller University and cancer research at Sloan Kettering. And I had started, st uh, began one of the first um, uh, methadone clinics, uh, HIV response in a methadone clinic out in Brooklyn. And uh, I was now at Harlem Hospital. And uh, it was a whole new experience being home to Harlem because everybody who left Lincolnville, South Carolina kind of tend to ended up in Harlem. Um, but I was just amazed at uh, in this hospital at that time of Moulton, the majority of the people in the hospital were uh, had, had uh, was living, mm -mm, were really dying, really, of HIV, uh, with dying of AIDS. And nobody was coming. So when I was doing my work, uh, on the on the wards, people wanted to talk. People wanted compassion. They wanted support, um, and there was no pastor coming. There was no mom and dad coming. Most people were really dying alone, uh, and I just had an idea. I can't say it no other way except I had an idea, and that idea was the Harlem Week of Prayer for the healing of AIDS. And certainly, thirty one years that thirty one years later, I can say it. That idea changed my life. Uh, and the idea really was to uh, create a AIDS awareness campaign that the Church of Harlem, the churches of Harlem, the and as what the religious community really, because it was the church, the mosque, the Ethiopian Hebrews, the Yorubas, the the uh, traditional Native Americans, really to 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 create an atmosphere where everybody can come together around an AIDS education campaign. Certainly, I was not the first person to go to the church. Uh, mm -hmm. And many people were, my critics were like, oh yeah, we done tried that, they, that ain't gonna happen. But they went to the church with a condom and a banana. Uh, and I went to the church with a week of prayer for the healing of AIDS. And cultural competence has always been so very, very important when addressing HIV and AIDS. So, you know, that's kind of the, the landscape that, that, you know, we were losing people. We were, we, we were losing some of the greatest creative minds, some of the greatest, you know, theological theological minds, um, not only in the in New York but across the country. Uh, mm -hmm. And it wasn't that the church didn't did not want to; the church didn't know how to. The mm -hmm. church couldn't come to a conversation around the things they weren't willing or able to talk about at that time. And Carrie, over these years, I've seen tremendous growth on these churches and what they would not talk about or what they were not willing to talk about to really putting their little toe in the water and now being able to stand up and really have difficult conversations which are no longer as difficult for some of them as it was 30 years ago. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so um, when you talk about um, it had been done before, um, it's, you know, they went with a condom and a banana. Um, what, do you, what do you feel um, made your prayer approach different? Well, the, the, the difference was is that, first of all, the church, all churches in Harlem were, ex was experiencing grief mm -hmm. and fear around HIV and AIDS. There mm -hmm. was no church or mosque that all synagogue that had not been impacted or affected by HIV and AIDS. So let's be clear about that. Um, and they wanted to do something. They just didn't know how to do it mm -hmm. um, because you know these were, these were difficult times. The church really didn't know how to uh, break out of its norm, if you will, and talk about sex. Now we right. can argue whether you know, they should be able to talk about sex, but you know, it's you know, there's a norm, and you know, and norms uh, get broken. So they were they they had not gotten to the place where they can talk about sex or homosexuality or or condoms. You know, abstinence was easy. You know, and to and to dismiss you know all of the all of the young girls who were getting pregnant through immaculate conception at 16, 17, 18. <laughs> you know, that was easy to dismiss as well. Um, right. But now HIV and homosexuality was in their face in a way that they just did not know how to break their theological norms and talk about it. So prayer, prayer gave them a way to 
find themselves in it. I remember uh, so often, so often when the when the church said, I said, you know, just, pr just pray, Pastor, I just want you to have a word of prayer. Well, 100% of the time, Carrie, when the church would pray, there would be someone who would come up to the pastor and say, Pastor, thank you for the prayer. I have HIV. Pastor, mm -hmm. thank you for the prayer. My son, my daughter has HIV. And that opened up a reality that there was all of this HIV in the congregation that right. the pastor actually was blind to. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But So once prayer, prayer was the catalyst, as it always is, for change. Because we know, you know, we know our motto, prayer does what? Change things. Change things. <laughs> so it was a catalyst for the pastor, the leadership to say, oh my God, look at how, I didn't know all these people were affected by HIV in my congregation. Then they are calling me. Then they are, where's that brochure? Sister Seal left. Then they mm -hmm. want workshop. Then they want uh, information because, you know, the veil of ignorance had, uh, had been uh, had been lifted had been lifted off. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, one thing that I'm always so grateful for is, um, you know, the one thing that you always say is um, the importance uh, or the notion of a little idea. Can you just have one little empowerment moment for the people um, about the importance of um, moving on that little idea? See, I thought this was going to be a few minutes. You want me to talk for five hours now? <laughs> You know, um, I I um, just, um, I think it was last night or yesterday or something, I was talking to someone, and uh, I am, I am humble. I am humble that uh, God, and I, and I truly believe this, that God chose me to give me an idea of a Harlem Week of Prayer for the Healing of Age, which gave birth to the bomb in Gilead. Uh, and, and, and certainly, I wouldn't have even thought that that little idea was going to roll into 32 years and an international organization having worked in, you know, in all the work that we've done in six African countries. And, you know, it's really about uh, your fundamental belief. Uh, I grew up with old, old Black folks in Lincolnville, South Carolina, who taught me how to listen to the still small voice of God. And um, so, you know, when I got this little idea, you know, I didn't, I was, I was, I was not clergy. I had a bald head. You know, I got more hair on my head now than I've had in a long time. Uh, <laughs> I did not know anybody. I knew nobody in Harlem. I was just on this new job for two days. Um, but I believe that, well, you know, that God had poured into me a little idea and I had to do something uh, about it. I certainly didn't have any money, didn't have no concept, knew nothing about none of this, really. Um, but when you get, when you, when you believe, fun of work, keyword on belief. If you believe that God is moving you in the direction to do something, then do it because, and you have to what? Get yourself out oh, of Lord. the way, which is, which keeps us in bondage because it's not the, the money, it's not the people, it's not the, oh, they just, you know, showing, throwing shade or they hating on me. It's none of that. What keeps us in bondage is that we keep ourselves and all of the issues that we bring to and that keep us in bondage. So with that, um, you know, this, we just have to learn to get ourselves out of the way so that if God has chosen to put an idea in you, he also, she also will pour into you everything that you need to move and to manifest that idea. Mm, absolutely. So, so the, the idea when God gives you a vision, he'll give you provision regardless right. of whatever it is <laughs> that's right and and you have to and you have to get yourself out the way so that those provisions can continue to flow absolutely absolutely so when you uh, uh just think back to when you knocked on the many doors that you did um what do you see as as some challenges um uh that you faced um <laughs> Well, the first, the first, the first, first church I went to was Memorial Baptist Church in Harlem, and uh, Reverend Dr. Preston R. Washington Sr. was the pastor, uh, and I went, and he was, he was the president of something he had created, was the Harlem Churches for Community Improvement, 
Uh, and so it essentially he had mobilized uh, all of the, 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 the Christian and the Muslims to come together to work for uh, housing and better conditions in Harlem. And everyone said, you need to go to see Preston Washington. So I went to Remora that Sunday and after church, I had to stand in line for a good hour uh, just to shake his hand. And when I got up to him, I shook his hand. And I said, Dr. Washington, I am Pernessa Seal and we, 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 we are having a Harlem week of prayer for the healing of AIDS. Now the reality is me, if we was me and the Lord, that's all, that's, those are the only two people, me and the Lord that was having this week of prayer. Uh, but it resonated. Maybe it was the way I said it. Was, that was my 30-minute uh, elevator speech. Um, uh, that was, um, he, he became one of my number one uh, supporters. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not really have, Carrie, uh, a, a, a lot of problems with the faith community because I didn't think they, I, looking back, you know, I think I had the right message and mm -hmm. I was not a threat. You know, I think probably with the faith community, because I was inclusive, I was inclusive with the Urbans. And, uh, and you know, they had, the, the Christians and Muslims were working together, but they were not that, all that, you know, excited about bringing in, uh, bringing in other traditions into the, into the community camp. Uh, so they had a little, you know, a little issue with, you know, why, you know, why Mama KK from Uruba was there and, and, and why, you know, the head of the, the, uh, the Uruba tribe out of South Carolina was coming up to Harlem to march around Harlem Hospital. Uh, they, had, they had some issues uh, with that, but I was clear about what the vision was. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe, and I still believe that we have to work around coming together uh, if we're going to, because we all are facing the same issues. We're all in this COVID fight and we continue to all be in this HIV fight. One of the major, the major um, challenges that I had that I really did not expect really came from the black gay community in New York. Uh, and if I can be just so transparent is that, you know, it was like, why, you, why are you trying to tell the church not to talk about sex? <laughs> And, uh, and that was not the case at all. And, mm -hmm. and I just got beat up, just beat, and I couldn't understand why I was being beaten up, but I further later on just really had to, you know, um, I began to understand just the, the anger and the pain and the hurt that so many of our brothers and sisters had experienced from the church mm -hmm. that my, my success in working with them became, but why are you even talking to them? You know what I mean? Da, 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 da. And I want to just lift up George Bellinger, George Bellinger Jr., uh, who became uh, a friend of mine and walked with me through that, you know, through those trying times, because I was, I, was, I was beat up. You know, I was like, well, why are y'all mad with me? I am trying to get the church to, to address, you know, your compassion, trying to get the church to address and support you know what I mean? HIV and be inclusive about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but my my biggest my biggest uh, uh, challenge was really bringing the Black gay community to the table uh, at the church because of a um, you know I, I I don't and I really I don't I don't want to say what it really was because people mm -hmm. experience what they experience. Um, but it was definitely uh, a challenge from that regard. But I did not get a lot of pushback. From the actual church community because they were hungry to find a way to to really address all the death and suffering that they were experiencing in their churches absolutely and so um from the harlem week of prayer um it transitioned to the black church week of prayer and then the national week of prayer uh for the healing of aids um from, from all of the transitions and looking forward, um, what do you see as um, some critical um, strategies um, that the, the faith community, communities of faith, can put into play um, to raise up um, uh, HIV? Um, because, of course, you know, one thing that you said uh, that, it, that I had to write down was uh, uh, we all are experiencing grief and fear around HIV. Well, we see that now. All of us are experiencing grief and fear around 
uh, COVID-19. Um, so looking at um, that, how can, what, what are some strategies that you think we can put into play uh, moving forward so that more places of worship can uh, lift up HIV and AIDS? Well, I think um, that's, a, that's a great question. And I think that, um, I think it's, it's, it's important that we always, when we're talking about the faith community, that we're always lifting up healing um, and, and prayer. Of, co of course, those of us who lift that up, we know that we're talking about education and awareness mm -hmm. and cultural competence. Mm -hmm. So often, like I just mentioned, so often when we talk about prayer and healing, so many people say, oh, well, but there they go praying again. But we're doing more than praying. We're using prayer as a catalyst mm -hmm. to have difficult conversations. So when we're talking and when we're working with the faith community, I think we have to continue to talk about prayer and healing and education. And we have to continue to be intentional about bringing the inclusivity of, of, of our diverse community and making sure that people have voices. Mm. Um, and, 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 and that can always be, you know, a, a, a tricky carry because mm. I, can, I can tell you stories of inviting diverse people into the pulpit and then they're standing in the pulpit, you know, uh, and they begin to talk about how they had great sex with their, I mean, right down to the orgasm, you know what I mean? Just inappropriate. It just, it's, right. it would be inappropriate for a heterosexual person to do that. You know right. what I mean? So I think that it's important, but we, but beyond that, you know, we cannot stop, uh, even when we have heterosexual uh, pastors that get up and say the most ridiculous things, you know, we cannot stop when we are, when we are hit by, you know, the boulders of of, 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 of fear, the boulders of anger, the boulders of, you know, just feeling awkward. We have to keep on working toward having those uh, conversations. And so I think uh, what we have learned, the bomb and Gilead, is that, you know, we're now inclusive of our health approach. You know, uh, we move, you know, HIV is a part of our conversation around Alzheimer's. It's a part mm -hmm. of our conversation around diabetes because, you know, when we were doing this in the early 90s, the church got fragmented. The church mm -hmm. got mad because Sister Mary got mad because y'all were talking about HIV and y'all wasn't talking about my diabetes. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, 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 and Sister J Brother John got mad because y'all wasn't talking about my cancer. Well, I got prostate cancer. Y'all ain't saying nothing about that. So, you know, when you, become, when you create a a, an, an inclusive conversation around health, it also provides a, a, a vehicle to bring more people into the conversation right. because they not only are you talking about HIV, that their grandson or grandmama or whoever may be in do, but you're also bringing a conversation around something that they're in, uh, in, uh, important to them, diabetes or Alzheimer's or dementia or whatever. So we've mm -hmm. seen that that, very, that, that that works. And lastly, because I can go on forever, lastly is, is that back in the, the 90s, you know, we had, we were focused. We had resources, amen for the resources. We had resources and we had focus. We had, you know, uh, lift up my, my, my dear sister, uh, Bishop Yvette Flunder. You know, uh, Bishop Flunder and I, she was not a bishop then. Yvette and I, we were running the CDC every single week, fighting, fighting, fighting. CDC then began a faith I, HIV faith initiative, you know. And I remember them calling me one day and said, Pernessa, we need a pastor. We need a pastor to talk about HIV. I was, well, I'm, I'm the one, but you ain't a pastor, Pernessa. We need a man. Well, okay, Reverend Edwin Sanders, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, you know, and, and Ed has done a fantastic job, but that came out of them not wanting a woman, but wanting a, a black man to have that conversation, which was the right black man to put in that space. And Ed has done a fantastic job and continues to do a fantastic job of carrying the water around HIV like no one else uh, could have done. But that was then, you know what I mean? And now, you know, we're fighting for crumbs when it comes to resources. 
You know what I mean? And I think that we cannot say that this work gets done without resources. It does not, you know? Mm -hmm. And so a part of the future conversation is how do we mobilize resources uh, to do the work? You know, mm -hmm. as you know, you know, for years, you coordinated the National Week of Prayer for the Healing of AIDS and all of those churches who wanted to be a part, you know what I mean? But they, that also, you know, Carrie, where's your ticket? Do you have your ticket? You know right. what I mean? Your hotel, <laughs> the churches need some resources to get their work out. It, you know, and we can, we can argue back and forth on what the church should do. Uh, right. But there are so many churches that we really want to reach, especially in communities in rural communities that don't have the resources, that Absolutely. we really have to support their capacity with resources to really do the work that we know that they can, can do uh, as, as a part of education and then empowering them to do that work in the community. So I think that going forward, you know, inclusivity, bringing people, diverse voices to the conversation, not one from anger, but actually know that you, we have partners now. We have mm -hmm. partners in the faith community that are ready to have, that have the conversation, whether you are there or not, those conversations are going on and it's not Pernessa or, or, or Ulysses or Carrie, they're having them. They are carrying the water without us. Uh, and so we don't have to come in you know, just so hurt and beat up, you know what I mean? That's a place for that too. But there are, you know, we have advocates in the faith community and we have to find creative ways to, to mobilize resources because CDC is not giving out no faith in HIV grant this year. Amen. Amen. So one last question, um, and this probably will uh, flip your wig a little bit. Okay. If you can pinpoint <laughs> one lesson that you've learned over the last uh, however, 30, 30 plus years, what, could, what would that one lesson be? One lesson. Um, <laughs> Maybe well, think a little Karen, bit. <laughs> you know, you, 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 you know, um, you know uh, yeah, as you know, one of my, one of my um, daily daily mantras is that no organization can go beyond the consciousness of its leader. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, the bar in Gilead is, not, is unable, cannot grow unless I, the leader, grows. And, and throughout this, um, this, these 30 years, you know, uh, I found myself in a place where I had to grow. You know, I had to um, uh, uh, make room for uh, other voices. You know, I had to um, make 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 room for uh, doing it doing it this way doesn't work uh, any anymore. I uh, and 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 also making uh, decisions where you, going back to those um, those difficult these these difficult decisions. I can remember you know at conferences bringing in transgender speakers. You know what I mean? To have conversations, you know what I mean? And, and, and saying, okay, am I going to, am I going to lose on this one? But doing the right thing. You know, there mm -hmm. are moments in time when we have to move out of our comfort zone, you know, and when you work with the faith community, oh my God, they're, they're you know, are they going to, are they going to crucify me? And sometimes, you know, in this work of HIV and faith, you really have to go in prayer, come out and say, okay, God, it's me and you, and we're going to bring these voices to the table. We're going to do the hard thing, and if, we, and if we get crucified, we get crucified, because not only the, the, the conversation, the social norm, the conversations does not move, uh, and the organization does not move. More importantly, the conversation, the community does not move if the leader doesn't move. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that right now we're in a we're in another transitional place. You know what I mean? And how we are going to how we're going to move from you know from this from this place like we've moved from other places. And every movement is a difficult decision, and it really comes down to: Are you willing to be crucified to do the right thing and mm -hmm. to say the right thing? And sometimes your crucifixion comes from places you did not expect. But you have to expand, expand, expand. So I think that's the that's the overall lesson learned that you know um, you have to continue to grow and you have to continue to step out and make room for those who are coming behind you, which is 
very important to me these days. You know, I'm I'm on the legacy side now and mm -hmm. and pouring into pouring into you and others and 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 sharing history and sharing lessons learned uh, and giving you the support that's needed to stand and be willing to be crucified is so important to me at this phase in my on my journey. Absolutely. Well, I thank you for this moment to dialogue. Um, God, so many nuggets that I've written down, uh, so much, so the, the wealth of information. And, and as you stated, you definitely are a legacy uh, bearer. So thank you so much for, for this time, Dr. Seal. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you so much. All right. You be. <laughs> thank you, Carrie. I echo your sentiments uh, to Dr. Seal. You all have given us a rich conversation. And I think the note in which you ended on about introducing diverse voices, uh, even if it means crucifixion, uh, is a great segue to hear from our diverse respondents that we have who will tell us what they heard uh, and what they didn't hear maybe, uh, and how it is that your conversation and your work has impacted their work and their lives uh, in the context uh, in which they uh, work, work and serve in. And so at this time, I want to uh, welcome Elder George Kerr uh, for his response, followed by Elder Kamarion D. Anderson Harvey. George, you have the floor. Good afternoon. First of all, I want to say thank you, Dr. Steele, and to Carrie for that very uh, in-depth conversation that could have taken all day, and we did it in such a short amount of time. And I've been asked to relate to my experience to what I heard. And I would like to start off by saying that I've been living with HIV for 25 years, come this October. And on Sunday, I will celebrate my 54th birthday. So most 90% of my life, adult life, I've lived with this. And I agree that grief and fear is a big part of this conversation because we've heard that in the beginning and now we're re-seeing it with this COVID-19. I want to thank the Bob and Gilead for talking about mental health and trauma and I think that um, the conferences that you had and the materials that you put together really helped us in all faiths to deal with that and so it's a really important conversation and we need more of it because I don't believe places of worship um, do enough conversation about mental health and I heard you talk about harm reduction and I am a big component of faith in the harm reduction and your work there is just amazing um, we need to do more though we need to educate I know here in Washington DC uh, several of the black churches don't believe in needle exchange programs and so we need to really educate about that. And I appreciate you talking about sex because we do need to have that conversation. A lot of people think that older adults are not having sex, but we are. Um, moving out of the comfort zone in a traditional place. And so I heard that and I think that that's where we're at right now. The, in, the connection between COVID-19 and um, the HIV is a big, big one that we have to work out and we need to have these conversations and that will help us to end the epidemic. Um, ending the epidemic, we need to have places of worship at the table with these conversations along with long-term survivors. And when we're coming up with these plans, I don't see a lot of um, churches or places of worship involved in these conversations. And I think that we are the backbone to ending the epidemic. However, and I will just end on this note, the connection to the Black Lives Matter movement. And we cannot end HIV if we cannot wholeheartedly say Black Lives Matter. And that has to be done in throughout every aspect of the epidemic. And so I just want to thank you for this incredible conversation. 
Thank you for your response, Elder Kerr. Now, Elder Kamarian Anderson Harvey, you have a floor. Thank you so much. And Dr. Steele, what a wonderful opportunity to, to hear your words. Um, wow, all I can say is I rolled with Bishop Flunder up under her reformation, and I just feel honored to be connected with you. Um, you're something else. And a couple things that I received, and, and if you don't mind, I'm not going to be politically correct. That's just who I am. Everybody knows, you know, we don't forget the D for a reason. But, you know, I hear a lot of things from your journey to where we are now and even connecting um, your academia status as well as your faith and so forth. A lot of things that I heard, especially when it came around funding and CDC and all of the name droppings that, you know, that um, require us to bring attention to those that have the power to make decisions, is, is that we, um, we are in, we're no longer patient as it relates to the excuses that we're receiving. We're no longer um, in position to watch the powers to be to remain lazy, okay? Y'all understand what I'm saying. Um, what resonated quickly when you were given the story about you and Bishop um, Yvette Flunder at the early state of having this conversation with those institutions, um, particularly CDC, and basically um, you had the product, you had the knowledge, um, I'm sure you had the army behind you, but yet they wanted um, a male identified um, individual for whatever reason that I only consume of institution misogynistic. Okay. And what happens is, is that when we center um, who is not coming to the table, then we don't put them in our programmatic um, work that we're doing. That's the reason why we're seeing a high risk of women, particularly black women and brown women, um, increasing um, in HIV, the epidemic of HIV, because we had the blueprint early, but yet you were removed in order for misogynistic to show up and bring in pops, as we call them affectionately, who did a wonderful job not leaving any of us behind. That hits me as a woman of trans experience, because when I show up, then you want to take either the ideals or tokenize, but you want to center it um, with someone else that is not going to allow you to deal with the stigma that we have on the inside um, that, that, perp that, that tends to um, hinder how we are even funding um, certain entities to do this work. Um, you also mentioned about going into various of churches. Now, everybody know I'm good in Pentecostal. Amen. Hallelujah. With the tongues and clapping of the hands and dipping and stuff. But in my narrative, and even doing this work of HIV and going into black churches, um, more tools that is needed, um, even for those that are going to get their higher education in theology, they don't even teach hermeneutics or exegete or looking at the text as it relates to how do we talk about current events? How do we talk about health? How do we even address sex um, and be sex positive because it is a gift from God? Um, uh, nevertheless, we, um, we are not hearing those levels of sermons that are going in there, and people like you and Dr. Flunder um, and Reverend Ulysses and Reverend um, Carey and so forth are going in, sharing these um, scriptures and biblical teachings and motivating the congregation, but at the same time, we're going to need the support from those leaders, from those boards, um, from those powers to be, all of these different structures you have to go through. Lives are right now being hindered. And, you know, I know we're in this COVID season, but at the same time, we have a blueprint through HIV um, to help us, and we're not even looking at that. Um, and so what I get out of all of this is to appreciate your hard work and to be motivated um, to partner with you, because when you do that retirement, you have to have some generals who can pick up where you left off, and it motivates me to hear your journey Here's some of the outcomes, but here's some of the, the, the really the, the frantic of how you're still having to work when really we should no longer be talking about HIV and funding, HIV and priority or demographic population, HIV as it relates to church. We shouldn't be speaking about that. What we should be speaking about is about life and life more abundantly. And if we're not speaking about life more abundantly from the crosses lens, 
then shame on us if we're not speaking about sex in the church and we're not speaking about contraceptives in the church and we're not speaking about um, cultural competency and how the blood covers everyone. And we're the ones that segregating this information out. I got a little happy because you motivated me to continue the work as a woman of trans experience that if you can show up as a cis-identified woman for years, nailing um, ideas, not to a cross, but to people who are putting us at risk being on the cross, then therefore everyone have an opportunity in this work of faith, religion, and also looking at sex in a different way that's going to reduce communities in order to be them getting contracted with HIV. So thank you so much for what you offer. I'm very much motivated and very honored to be on this webinar and to hear from you. Thank you to Elder Kerr and Elder Anderson Harvey. Uh, Dr. Seal, I wanna give you an opportunity to respond to the response, uh, but I also want to make room for questions uh, that uh, have come from our audience uh, as we have about seven minutes left uh, during our program. Uh, we have one question in the chat box from Dr. David Barstow, who asks about the current engagement within Harlem churches, specifically uh, Harlem churches that have HIV programs. And while we know that the Bob and Gilead's work is international now, uh, it started in Harlem. Um, and so maybe this is an opportunity for you to talk not only about uh, where Harlem churches are, but where Black churches are writ large in 2020 as it relates to um, HIV programs. Um, and then we also have a question from Cedric B, uh, which I will uh, give him the floor to ask now, and then uh, we'll hear from your response to what you heard, both from the respondents and the audience's questions, and we will close. So, Cedric, you have the floor. Hello, and thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Good. My name is Cedric Burgess. I use the B because I don't want to use my real name all the time. <laughs> Yesterday, there was a uh, viewing of Blackbird, uh, awesome, awesome movie with Monique. And it was just, you, each of you should see it. If you get a chance to check it out, check it out. And I want to introduce you to something called Not In My Family. It's a book. And it has several celebrities in it that talk about HIV in their lives and what have you. But Monique is in it also on chapter 14. Dr. Jo uh, Joycelyn Elders, Reverend Al Sharpton, uh, Jesse Jackson, Patty LaBelle, many, many big name people are in this book. And I highly recommend it to take to whoever you can just to let them glance through it, to let them know how real this is. It's not a closed session. It is an open session. HIV and AIDS is all over the place. And I've been HIV positive for over 35 years and I've seen it from the beginning. So I know the hell it is. And I know it's not fun for all of us. God have mercy, amen. That's it. Dr. Seal, if you can wrap all of that up and tie it all together in five minutes. Let's well, I want I, I, I want to um, you know thank the responders. Uh, I don't I cannot say anything else except uh, thank you, and uh, and want to encourage want to encourage you to to stay the course, to stay the course, and um, and just 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 keep on keeping on. You know, everybody is not going to agree uh, with you, and, and that's okay because God gave you the idea, uh, and you have to stay focused to what you believe. You were don't believe what you believe. God is saying. Uh, God is saying to you, and sometimes that's not easy uh, because everybody tends to think they know what God is telling you. And sometimes, and we make mistakes. Sometimes we make mistakes, and when we make mistakes, we have to say, you know what? We made a mistake. Get up, get going, and keep on going. So just thank you for your for your your support. Thank you for living. Thank you for living your best life every single day. You know, and 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 living it out the way you believe that God is calling you uh, to live it out. Uh, Harlem churches today. You know, I'm happy to say that many of those churches who started out, like St. Luke's AME Church, uh, up there, way up yonder in Harlem, uh, are still on the front line of doing HIV and HIV work. Um, 
uh, I would I would also um, say that many churches in their transition. When I look back at those uh, those historic pictures in the 1989 and 90, sometimes I'm the only one still living. Ain't that something? You know, uh, there has been a major transition uh, with the leadership in Harlem churches. And uh, the next generation, you know, uh, I think too far few of them uh, kept up the banner of HIV. Um, you know, the, the church overall has been in transition. And I can, you know, there's been some good and some bad. And if I should just give you two example. One example is a, a new pastor came into one of the churches, a uh, 25-year-old gun hold new pastor, and he calls me up and he says, uh, Sister Seal, you know, I have all of these uh, young people who are coming into the church. You know, they're gravitating to the church because, you know, he's 25 and he can rap and he can do his thing, and he's just bringing in these young people. And, um, and the older folk, the tithing folk, are having a big problem with them. Uh, so he said, what should I do? I said, well, I think, you know, you have to decide on what your ministry is going to look like. Is your ministry going to, is going to grow and be inclusive of the young people or are you going to turn them, turn them out? So he decided he was going to meet with these young people on Saturday, really to, to listen to them and to help them, um, uh, get groomed to come in, how to come into church on Sunday. You know what I mean? Uh, the, the, the social norms of, of, of the black church on Sunday. Uh, and in doing that, in doing that, in meeting with them on Saturday, he got to know them, you know, and he got to, to hear that, you know, the majority of the, the young girls, 14, 15, 16, 17, were identifying as lesbians. You know, and, uh, and, there, and and one girl said, you know, well, my mama said I can't have sex with boys until I'm 18, so therefore I'm going to be a lesbian until I'm 18. You know what I mean? And just, so he, he got to, this is just a, 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 a child who is coming into her sexuality and just like all of us, we don't know what we're doing. We're just thinking, we're trying to figure it out. You know, but that pastor in making a decision to meet with those young people, got to know them, got to hear them, got to create ministry that supported them as he moved them in to the Sunday morning service and brought genera a generational consciousness into the church. I think that was a good thing. Now there's another church, another church who was having the same situation, but this was not a trans transfer of pastor this was a transfer transition of community okay the older pastor remains there until today uh, but the community around had changed so all of these new people were coming in and he decided he was going to give he was going to choose a, a new youth leader a youth leader who had a little you know uh turn it up kind of but you know thing going on and and the and the new leader began to bring in so many new young people in the church and the old folks was yes again again was having a problem having a problem but this pastor he decided that he was going to not he was not going to engage the process of bringing these young people into the church he was going to plant a new church he was going to plant a new church and, and give these young people, this young pastor, a whole new church and let him go down there and do his own thing. I would choose option one, but that's my own opinion, because I think that in this, we need intergenerational community. We need, and so in doing that, a lot, in, and I'm talking about HIV, a lot that was happened, some things have changed and some things did not go as we would have wanted them in the transition of leadership because the black church has gone through a transition over these last 30 years and is still going through a transition of this 30 years. And I think that in the new transition, we have a lot of opportunity to really work and build capacity of young pastors who do not come to the ministry with such baggage. They don't come with so much baggage that I used to say, you know, well, sometimes with some churches, some denominations, I had to wait until the leadership died, which I had to do. And once they died, the new leadership was willing to hear new conversations. But I, so I think that there's a transition that has happened as it is happening in our seminaries that we have opportunity to 
partner with young people, young leadership that does not come with so much baggage. Amen. Amen. And on that note, I say amen to all of you. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank our respondents. Uh, and I want to thank our audience for your engagement during this uh, one hour a webinar series on HIV and faith and resilience and renewal. If you were blessed by what you heard and you want to hear more, uh, the second conversation in this series on the legacy and future of the U.S. faith response to HIV and AIDS will take place uh, roughly one month from now on Sunday, August 30th at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and it will feature uh, Reverend Edwin Sanders, who you heard uh, lifted up by Dr. Seal, as well as our sister Khadija Abdullah in a discussion about National Faith HIV AIDS Awareness Day, which also happens to be on that Sunday, August 30th. Again, we give thanks for each and every one of you. Uh, and I want you to remember that we all used to be someone else. What's most important is that we're always working to be better today than we were yesterday. You be the cure you wish to see in the world. Peace and blessings, everyone. We'll see you next month. Amen.